thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sharon. Um, did a bit of research. You did? Yes. Mm -hmm. you, had, you did an interview with Eternity News. I think it was a couple of years back mm -hmm. or something like that. And you explained that economics is the science of material prosperity mm -hmm. and that economics can help us understand what it is that can make us richer materially rather than poorer. Mm -hmm. For some of us, there are some dots missing between work which focuses on building material wealth mm. and following Jesus. Mm. So, first question, what's it, what's it like to be a Christian and a prof professional economist? Well, you can find yourself the object of suspicion by both sides. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the economists wonder what on earth you're doing dabbling with something that isn't, isn't evidence-based and smells a bit superstitious. And your Christian brethren wonder what on earth you're doing studying a subject as base as economics because all it's about is material things and nothing about faith and spirit and the Lord. Both of those positions are, of course, exaggerated and I'm going to argue false. Uh, in actual fact, in my experience, and I know I have other Christian colleagues in the room, so I'm interested to hear whether they agree with me on this, that it, um, and it's taken me some time, admittedly, Sharon, to, to live this and come to grips with it, uh, I find that it's quite straightforward. After all, uh, as any Christian would do, your first commandment is to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. Okay, that's common to all of us. The second then is to love your neighbour as yourself. Uh, and an economist seeks to love his or her neighbour um, like him or herself by advising governments in particular about policies that can help to improve the material circumstances of the community, to alleviate poverty, to alleviate disadvantage, to help people to be free of material constraints that bind them. Uh, you know, the Lord Jesus is pretty strict about poverty being a bad thing. Right? Uh, and, of course, he doesn't say that wealth is necessarily all that life is about, on the contrary. But neither does he pick on people particularly and say, you know what, you're a wealthy person, you should give all that away. Uh, in some circumstances, yes, he does, because he knows that the person is worshipping that. But wealth in and of itself is not a bad thing. So loving your neighbour by helping uh, governments to behave more responsibly and to deliver uh, basic services that people need, uh, like health and education, welfare services, those systems, the design of them, the way they're administered, there's a lot of economics that goes into running those systems more or less efficiently. People would be concerned about the environment. We need to be, as Christians, stewards of the environment. Well, econ economics has a lot to say about how you can interact with the resources of the earth uh, more or less efficiently. And one more uh, scripture. The scripture for economists I often think is Jeremiah 29.7. Right? So you seek the prosperity of the city uh, and uh, pray for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And what economists do in that broad level is to seek the prosperity of the city. If it prospers, we will prosper. Uh, what it doesn't mean is that we then turn around and worship wealth. And so economics is not about that. So behind the question, Sharon, or the implication is that that's what economics is doing. It's lionising material wealth and saying that's what you should strive for. That is a distortion. That's a contortion of the discipline. Uh, but of course, you know, there are economists who might believe that. Plenty of non-economists believe that. Uh, but the discipline itself does not endorse that. That's not what it's about. Well, thank you for helping us, I guess, relate rightly to the science of economics. Mm. Um, tonight, we're obviously talking about vulnerability mm. and vulnerability to that extent in the workplace. Now, is it important to differentiate between the office you hold and who you are as a person yep. in the office? Yes, well, I think that's very, very important. And uh, there are two reasons for that. I think the first is that um, particularly in, as you go through your careers and you occupy more and more senior offices, uh, it becomes very important for your own peace of mind and your own survival to differentiate between those two. That's reason number one. Uh, the second reason is that whoever you are, whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, and you are entrusted with a public office uh, or any sort of office, it could be you know, running a company, then you've been asked to do a particular job. You've been entrusted to exercise authority in a particular way. And as Christians, I think it's extremely important that we take that trust seriously. Right? 
and we honour that trust. We have a very high view of trustworthiness because our God is trustworthy and we trust him. So if you're given a trust, whether it's a public trust or a private trust, then as Christians, first and foremost, what you would seek to do is to honour that trust. And you do that by exercising the authority such as it's given, the powers that you're given in a way which exhibits that trustworthiness and honour. If you abuse that trust, if you think, here's an opportunity now that I've been given this position, I can actually use this to aggrandise myself and my position. And let me say it, if you want to turn something into a position where you think, here's an opportunity for me to preach the gospel, that is not written in my KPIs. That is not part of the office. Right? If you decide to abuse the office in that way, then in my book, what you've done is to breach trust. You breach trust with those who've given you that office. And what you've done in my book, friends, is to dishonour Christ. Now, if you don't feel as though you can accept that trust and behave honourably, then don't take the position. Do whatever else you think that God has called you to do. So, Sharon, um, I think it's extremely important to differentiate between those two. Uh, and there are common, you know, um, uh, pictures that show this. So those are the older members of the audience will, will remember uh, the story of the Wizard of Oz. Uh, that everybody thinks the Wizard of Oz is some grand, fearful thing. And at the end of the movie, of course, or the book, you realise that the Wizard of Oz is a little man sitting on a, on a stool speaking through a megaphone. Right? And yet the Spoiler world alert. saw him as something powerful. A more modern example, maybe even not as modern as it could be, is Darth Vader. When Darth Vader is finally unmasked, that fearful character, what's in there, of course, is a frightened, wizened old man. So when you take on the Darth Vader mask, it's important to remember that, that there's a world of difference between how people perceive the mask and what's actually going on inside. And you need to keep those two things in mind very carefully uh, for your own health, your own mental health, and for your uh, trustworthiness and honouring the office which you've been asked to fulfil. Mm. I'm interested to know, um, perhaps some of us in the room, and certainly for your experience as well, some of the offices, mm. the roles that you have held are mm. in quite high leadership. Is it ever appropriate for a Christian leader to wear a mask? Most definitely. Uh, and here again, we're just looking to the example of the Lord Jesus himself. How many times did Jesus say to people that he'd healed, don't tell anyone else about this? To his own disciples, when Peter confessed that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, he said, don't tell anyone else about that. And of course, he was 30 years old before he revealed that he was more than just the carpenter's son. I'm not a theologian, but my interpretation of that is that Jesus knew he had a particular mission. And, and the timing, as with all missions, was of the essence. And so it was important that he not suddenly be hailed as a healer. That's not what he primarily came to do. Don't tell anyone else. Right? And when his disciples confess who he is, he would not yet. Right? And even when Pilate mocks him and says, are you the king of the Jews? You say so. It doesn't take him on. There's a time and a place for us to exercise the authority that we've been given. And there's a manner in which it should be done. So, Sharon, my answer to that is that it's entirely appropriate for people in positions of authority to wear masks. If by wearing masks, right, I mean again, that what I'm doing is within a particular time and a particular juncture, I'm using the authority in a particular way. Okay? Even though throughout that process inside the mask, my knees are knocking. And I'm feeling like an imposter. Right? That's all natural. But that doesn't mean that I should reveal that now. You can imagine, for instance, if our Prime Minister, who is a believer were to have exhibited a great deal of emotion on any number of occasions that we've experienced recently 
when people of Christian faith or not are looking to that office to give us some sense of direction and comfort and assurance in circumstances which are extremely threatening, that he would suddenly fall apart and say, oh, God, this is all just, I mean, it's just too hard. It's terrible. Now, most of us would think what's entirely natural, I would probably feel the same thing in the face of those pressures. But is he doing the office a service by allowing that mask to fall away? People have to be encouraged. People have to be strengthened. And you see it happen every day in medicine. The, the, the doctor knows precisely what the circumstances are. What doctor goes to the patient in extremis and says, look, there isn't a lot of point, you know, you're going to be dead in the next few hours anyway, so we'll just, you know, right? What doctor does this? The doctor keeps the mask almost to the very end and says, it'll be fine. We'll look after you. You're going to get through this. You'll be fine. Now, at the very end, of course, the truth will out. The point I'm making to you is, that that is what I would describe as, if you like, a white lie. It's a mask. The doctor is trying to encourage the person, even unto the end, to have hope and not to give up in full knowledge that unless there's a miracle, at any reasonable expectation is the person will pass soon enough. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with wearing masks. So where masks are a problem is where they are deliberately intended to be deceptive. And I think that's what's sort of lurking behind here, is the sense that we deceive and we dissemble. We aren't who we really say we are. Well, I think it's fairly clear that that's to be condemned. Uh, and I would say absolutely, uh, lying to people, pretending to be who you are not, uh, that is something which is to be avoided. And, and now if it's deliberate, it's to be condemned. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting point to make that Sometimes your office requires you as duty, mm. responsibility, um, garnering that trust as well that you will have right. to wear a mask of some sort. That's right. um, on that example of Jesus, uh, it is interesting that he does come before his disciples um, unmasked mm. at times. Particularly mm. I'm thinking of um, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. That's right. Um, is it ever appropriate uh, despite the office you hold, to mm. weep before your colleagues? Yes. Like, in what sort of situation is that actually something that's very um, appropriate and real and needed? Well, I'll give you an example of my own experience there. So, so rather than sort of saying, oh, you know, in these circumstances, do this, right? Uh, let me tell you what happened to me. So we had um, a young colleague in, our, in the wider team of which I was a part uh, who... Uh, contracted breast cancer and then began the treatment and the news got progressively worse. And so none of my colleagues, of course, of course, the absences from work got longer and longer and then eventually the message was fairly clear that our colleague wasn't going to survive this. Uh, well, I mean, that's enough, bad enough people to sort of carry that around and try to do, what, do her work for her and do what we could. I'm um, coming into work one day and, and uh, my... Uh, EA texted me and said, um, Penny died last night. And I thought, oh. And then the next part of the text said, uh, the colleagues have gathered in the um, uh, lunchroom and they've asked if you would come and speak to them. Now, several things went through my mind. The first is... That, that I'm not trained to do this. I'm not a grief counsellor, right? Uh, and I don't want to put on a mask, Sharon, that I'm a grief counsellor, right? So part of me is saying, no, 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 isn't there somebody else who can do this? Isn't there a priest <laughs> or a counsellor or somebody, right? I dispense with that fairly quickly because I felt uh, the Spirit saying to me, your colleagues need you. And they've asked you to do this, right? Because you haven't been wearing a mask. So my colleagues, not that, you know, they would not come and talk to me about the things of God, hardly ever. Right? Uh, but they knew that I was a man of Christian faith. 
And one of the things that if you don't know this already, you'll soon discover it, is that it is, it is the one topic which will bring people who aren't believers to you. Right? Death. It's such an affront. It's such a shock. The, the deep sense that this is somehow wrong. right? And yet, they've nothing to say. Oddly enough, and it's still true, thank God, people will think a Christian has something to say. And you might think, but hang on, aren't they just going to mock me for, you know, pie in the sky and, and, and anodyne comments about don't worry about it? Because that's not what Christians do. What, what do we do? <laughs> what did the Lord Jesus do? He wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, right? He knew that within hours, whatever the timing was, he would raise Lazarus and he'd be restored to his family. So why didn't he just say to the sisters, hey, what's all this about, right? You know, Lazarus is coming back. What do you mean he's dead? Hey, well, no, 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 no. He was deeply moved, and it wasn't the only occasion, by seeing the impact of this thing that he had come to defeat. (laughs) The impact of this on these people's lives, right, is deeply shocking and offensive and brought him to tears to see what death would do. Well, it's still true that people think, thankfully, mercifully, that Christians have something of comfort to say in those circumstances. And I was struggling with the inadequacy that I was going to have, I'd be the person to have to do this, but that was the name. What am I going to do? Turn my colleagues down? No. So I went to meet my colleagues, and sure enough, by the time I got there, there weren't half a dozen, there was about 30 people, because the news had filtered out. 30 confused, upset, sad, angry young colleagues of my deceased colleague, waiting for me to come and say something. So I did exactly that, Sharon. I, I, I didn't quote, I didn't sort of read the Bible, I told the story. And I said, I started out by saying, you know what? I said, I don't know why this happened to Penny. I don't know. But what I do know is that it wasn't supposed to be this way. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. And the reason I know that, and then quoted the story. And through that, of course, you could see them listening, you could see them watching. As I say, some are angry, some are weeping. And then I said, and because it's not the way it's supposed to be and because it is such a shocking thing, we need to support one another, we need to grieve together, And we need to weep together. And then I wept. Well, I'm not the right person to ask what they made of that. You could ask them. But suffice to say, uh, it was an opportunity when I felt reluctantly, right, that, uh, well, Sharon, the truth is, I couldn't have kept a mask on if I'd tried. That's the honest truth. I couldn't have done that. So there you are. Yeah. Thanks for sharing mm. that, no, that powerful that intimate happened. moment. It'll happen to you too. Something like that. Mm. Something like that. Mm. I think it is um, confronting when other people, uh, not just Christians in our workplaces, but our colleagues come to us unmasked. Mm. That is also equally confronting. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think what is so powerful about that story mm. is that you weren't trying to mask that. No, you I had was trying to run away. <laughs> Well, you know what I mean. Yes, that was my first absolutely. reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose flipping it the other way then, mm. what words of encouragement could you say to a Christian whose vulnerability has been used against them in the workplace? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I can go straight to James, can't I? Consider it joy, right? Uh, and at some level, of course, what James is saying is completely right, right? You know, Jesus himself said that we should regard it, in a sense, as an honour. Uh, if we are persecuted for Jesus' name. So point number one is that we need to be clear that we are being persecuted because of our faith or because of something we've said. We've made ourselves, our Christianity, vulnerable. Uh, If we are in strife for things that we have done that are not godly, that are not of God, well, then we can't, you know, claim (laughs) 
the protection of James. You don't want to consider that joy. You want to consider that, frankly, an embarrassment, right? <laughs> uh, or even a disgrace. That's not joy. Uh, look, my experience on that front, some of you will know, uh, those who, who were watching, watching the time, you mentioned that I had the privilege of setting minimum wages in this country. Uh, when I was appointed to that office, I was asked to go and address a Christian audience like this. And um, the question was asked of me then, uh, how did I feel about it? This was by Christian brothers and sisters, right? How did I feel about taking on this office of setting minimum wages when many people in the Christian community thought that I'd sold out to the conservative government and what I was about to do was to drive minimum wages down? So this was a hostile Christian audience, right? Who were asking me, not quite so directly, but it was, what do you think you're doing? Was the intimation. And so I answered that question by saying, look, I understand that people have different views about the government's policy on this and you're entirely welcome to that. As far as I'm concerned, let me say this. I didn't accept this office before I'd prayed and felt in my own heart that I was being called to this office. And I will seek to fulfil this offer to the best of my ability, you know, given my skills and such as they are, and with my Christian faith intact. At the back of the room, well, the Christians more or less, more or less were sort of happy with that. But at the back of the room were a bunch of secular media. So the next day in the Sunday age or the age comes the headline, God to set minimum wage. <laughs> right? Okay. And some dear person who, who took great offence at what I said said that you may as well consult the entrails of an owl. Right? Okay. So up went the balloon. And, and it was clear that I was, well, I was being persecuted. Uh, had a, had a, a, someone of Muslim faith or a Jewish person got up, I, I, I conjecture right, that nothing would have been said. And in fact, to attack such a person would have been regarded as the grossest offence against that person's ethnicity. It might have even been considered to be racist. I mean, who knows? But a white Anglo-Saxon male, a man as an educated man, what are you doing mucking around with this sort of stuff, right? You deserve everything you get. Somebody tried to accuse me of breaching the Constitution. How do you like that? Right? <laughs> By uh, essentially muddling church and state. And, of course, that person has, with due respect to them, such a, an ignorance of the Australian Constitution that if there is one thing the Constitution says about religion and the state, it says this. There shall be no religious test for any office of the Commonwealth, section 116, right? <laughs> and what this person was doing was applying a religious test. Him, he's a Christian. He is therefore disqualified. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is unconstitutional. Right? <laughs> anyway, I didn't have that discussion. But uh, <laughs> I was taken uh, to task for this. And, and, and so what was the answer? Well, I felt pretty sort of awful about it. And the person who gave me the key was uh, Kim Beasley, uh, the current governor of Western Australia. Very fine man, as you know, a Christian. And Kim, not directly speaking about my circumstances, he was speaking about his circumstances. Because people, of course, used to attack him and his father uh, for being prominent Catholics and involved in government and taking their Catholicism into government. And he simply said very wisely, he said, no person fulfills any office, let alone a Commonwealth office, without taking their values with them. So the person who is not a Christian and possibly of no religious faith at all, is that person saying that he or she will fulfill this office without in any way consulting their values, who they are, what they regard as right and wrong? And if the answer is, well, no, of course I'd take my values right then at the very least what I'm doing is making it clear what my values are. And you can do two things. One, you can find out for yourself what they are because they're written in a book. And you can get the book quite freely. And you can hear that book exposited at any time on a, on a Sunday around the country, and I wish you would, right? <laughs> the second thing that I would say is this, and you can hold me to account. Because if I don't behave according to these values, you can see it right in front of you. You can call me out. Now, what about you? Can I call you out? Where are your values written down? How will I know whether you're behaving with integrity, whether you're wearing a mask, right? 
or whether you're misleading. How would I know? Well, you'll know that of me, my friend, because I've nailed my colours to the mast, for better or worse. And when you see me or you think that I'm being inconsistent, you'll call me out and I'll have to try to explain that. But at the very least, I'm putting on the table where I stand. Once Kim said that, I thought, thank you. <laughs> that is exactly right. So whether it's a public office or a private office or any office that you're called into in the workplace, right, you don't hide the fact that you're a Christian. If somebody challenges you and says, well, how could you be manager of our division or head of our team? I mean, you know, you're a Christian. They're not going to put it quite like that, but if that's the implication, then you can simply say that's absolutely right. And therefore, you know what I stand for. And you'll be able to hold me to account if you think that and somehow or other I've demonstrated favoritism or dishonesty or lack of trust, untrustworthiness, any of those things. I'm not claiming to be more competent. That ain't what it's about, right? I might actually be incompetent but my faith and my values will enable you to see what it is I stand for. That's how I think that's important. So I'd encourage Christians, wherever you are, to make it clear where you stand. You don't brag about it, or shout it from the rooftop necessarily, but, but you make it clear. One final point on that, Sharon. Remember that apart, apart from death, the other thing that non-Christians will look to you for is some sort of moral statement or guidance. Even, yes, even though they think the world is an amoral place and there's no right and wrong, yeah, that's right. That's why everyone gets so upset about child molestation, isn't it? Right? You know, no right and wrong. People realise that there is right and wrong. They get that. But they can't work it out. They've got no compass, no guidance, other than what's in the gut, thank goodness, general revelation. What they don't have is the special revelation. But they think we do. So they're going to ask you or they're going to look. And as the rest of the conversation goes around and around, they're waiting for the Christian to say, uh, actually, if you ask me, I'm opposed to this uh, because I think it's wrong. And they'll say, you think it's wrong? Why? And then you might say, because I think it's unfair. I think it's discriminatory. I think whatever you want to you know, whatever... Christian value is offended by this, then you say that. And in my experience, afterwards, people will come along and they'll say things like, thank you for saying that. Right? I wanted to say that it was wrong because I think it's wrong, but I couldn't explain it or I didn't have the courage or things of that sort. So, you know, be of good courage. Sursum corda. Right? People are waiting for you to say these things. Will you get mocked? Yes. Will someone say that you're unconstitutional? Possibly. <laughs> uh, but, but there's also a deep sense these days that when you say, but, you know, I thought we were all free to express the things we really believe in and I want to be authentic. Isn't that what you want? Well, I'm being authentic. I'm telling you who I really am. And I'm sorry if you don't like it, but I'm telling you the truth. Thank you very much. Pleasure. On that note, let's thank Ian Harper for the conversation. Yeah.